I wanted to begin by just saying that I am on the traditional and unceded territories of the Okanagan CU people. And this place, when I'm in like my, my hometown, what it does for me is it allows me to feel that I'm in presence of really welcoming and wonderful people as well as non-humans, like, you know, just the birds and all the nature that I'm around. And it, it really makes me feel secure um, and loved just within the environment in the mountains. And that's something that I really wanna bring into this conversation and hold space for in our conversation, because I just feel like it is gonna go into asking you some, some of these conversations, uh, some of these points that are really hard to discuss. And it's that invisible labor of even just discussing it that I wanted to say I can see and I really wanted to acknowledge right off the bat. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your time. Thank you for acknowledging it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so, I know that you experienced your ayahuasca journey recently, and I, I have to ask you if you feel comfortable talking about it, what showed up for you? How is the experience? Yeah, I mean, I never talk about my ceremonies, actually, because they're so private, um, but I can talk about themes. Um, I, um, firstly, like, you know, what you said about the land, I, I absolutely resonate with you, like, um, my teacher is uh, was taught by a Lakota elder a lot of the ways in which she like passes down um, like prayer to us, and so I've learned how to pray with cedar and tobacco, and you know in the Lakota tradition, or I think in a lot of Native American traditions, it's so important to um, give gratitude to the land and. Um, to the seven sacred directions or the four elements. Like there's something that I'm learning that's so powerful about being in co-creation with this planet. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just really honoring that. And I'm really grateful that we're like, bring, bring that into the space. Um, but um, yeah, I use, I use ayahuasca and I've been sitting with grandmother for just over a year and a half now. Um, and this last ceremony showed me that um, she's just an incredible plant. She's so wise. Um, she's such a, a sacred medicine. And that's why I really want to have and maintain this relationship with her that's very sacred. Um, but the work is so deep and, you know, the more I think and sit with her, the more I'm like, oh yeah, like it makes sense. I have such extreme trauma. And this has sort of been like the safest container that I've been able to look at that. And actually like have been thinking a lot about how I want more South Asians to have access to this kind of healing because so many of us need it so badly. And I think that a lot of the trauma that exists in our communities is to do with this like lack of articulation and a lack of fully grasping what's happened to us and feeling so in terror and so unsafe in our own bodies because that was so much of like the ways in which we were dehumanized, um, there's a complete dislocation of oneself from spirit and land. And so, yeah, the, there's just like this, everything that's happening with, in South Asia with, you know, fascism and, and the sort of like absurgence of, of Brahminical supremacy and even just what's happening with the protests and the farmers and, and the fact that Modi is trying to create this very like white Western centric model for a society that's very um, austere is not Indian. It's not like it's not it's not even like the ways in which we're we're Indian, you know, like that's what's so fucking crazy. It's like, I mean, Hinduism has a lot of anti casteist movements within it, you know, historically always has. And so to deny that kind of complexity is so upsetting. And 
Um, yeah, I've just been thinking a lot about that through ayahuasca and through like acknowledging that um, I can't just heal myself. I have to, I'm healing my family and my cultural lineage, you know, and that's the sort of commitment that I'm taking. And that's the only kind of commitment I want to make because nothing else really makes sense for me right now. Like I need to, I need to talk about these things. I need to, um, I need to talk about healing because yeah, if I didn't, if I wasn't taking these active steps, I'd be dead. I know that so clearly for myself, you know? So I have no choice. Sorry I'm moving around so much. I know, yeah, what, what the fuck, no, it's all good. Um, well, I remember reading something where you, you wrote or you said in an interview that you've been writing like a bird for 18 years. Mm -hmm. So that this idea of service and this idea of having to communicate and try to, yeah, serve people like that's been a part of you for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like at a young age, I, I'm not sure how old you are, but that it feels like you've been carrying this for a really long time. Yeah. Um, I'm 31 and yeah, I wrote it for 18 years. And you're right, you, you, yeah, you under, you seem to understand something that's very, I think, deep in my, the fabric of who I am. I have to serve, I have to be of service. And I think that's just because I love God. I have just like a very, very like, um, uh, deep relationship with the divine that you know, we're just here as vessels. That's all we're here to, to be and to do. Like art is not about ego. That's why capitalism destroys art. It's not, it's, it's, it always has been something that you were channeling. And, you know, like even in, in again, like, I mean, as a writer, you know, the sort of legacy of poetry throughout South Asia and Muslim worlds, it's like writing was always a way to evoke something deeper in yourself to connect to God. Um, and so like Rumi and Kabir and Hafiz, and there's so many devotional poets that understand that, um, yeah, you're always trying to, you're always trying to decode language to then like give people a perspective or to feed people with like, I. I can't just heal for myself. It wouldn't make any sense. It's like, I have this gift and like to write for me is so easy. I, that's why I can do like 15 things at once. Cause like, I just feel like I'm running on pure energy, you know? So it's like, it always feels so, um, recycles. And I think I'm like finally at that place where it's like, I'm not even thinking anymore. I'm I'm transmuting. And, and so I think within that relationship, it's just very honest. Um, and I have to keep myself honest. You know, I think part of this work, the healing work I do is also to remind myself that I don't want to get lost in the bullshit. I don't want to get lost in like the aestheticism of success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a conflict when you are in the epicenter of capitalism and materialism. Um, I think you're in Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. New York. I mean, I wonder, you said something about cycles. Um, how much does just kind of natural cycles um, influence you and your work, um, whether that's seasonal or, you know, just regeneration um if you plant like how much do you lean on on non-humans for the work that you do yeah i think i lean on now like primarily non-humans <laughs> yeah a lot of the cycles i've been thinking a lot about like um like the seven sacred directions in native american tradition it starts with east which is the rising sun so that's when things are blooming the south you know things are 
are kind of like setting, but not completely. By the time it gets to the West, it's it's you're 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 asking to let go. You're asking to kind of prepare yourself for the North, which is where the great unknown is and the mystery of life is. And so that's sort of like the four sacred directions that then moves to Mother Earth and then Grandfather Sky. And then you're at the center, you're the seventh. And I've just been thinking a lot about like being in the North, like being in all different directions, but also like being in the North where there's never been language in my conception of time where like, where I've accepted that like sometimes you're just floating in midair and you don't know where it's going to land and you've taken a bet on yourself or you know like I feel like writing like a bird was taking a bet like I made no money on the book like I nobody believed in it I was just sort of like okay like I don't know I just think that this needs to be published um and I just trusted my instinct and it's not done the ways like, it, it, you know, because when you're a writer, especially when you live in capitalism, you have to divorce yourself from like what success looks like as well. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel successful, which is where the invisible labor comes in monetarily. You know, I think it's interesting that I'm successful in a very like Instagram, social media way where like people are clearly buying my books, they're reading my books, but that's not being seen or met by me. I have a good life. I can't complain, but it's like, I don't think it like makes sense. It's not like, it's not equal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I constantly feel like I'm um, kind of like running on steam. But then when I can tell myself that there is something so sacred and clarifying about actually even having an audience that anyone, like a hundred people would buy my book, it, it kind of humbles you and puts you in this like awareness of like, okay, like it's not ideal, but it's still fucking amazing. And I think I'm like right there right now where like every time I sit in ceremony, things are put into perspective to me about like why my life had to happen the way that, that it happened. So I, I have immense, like, I guess just acceptance over it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's something that's really humbling when going through any type of spiritual journey. Um, I certainly experienced that when I first went on my mushroom journey a few years ago. Um, you mentioned well, that about like a bird. It's almost um, it's almost six months old. So it's yeah. half a year. Yeah. So how has your relationship with the book evolved? You know, it's like even like the two sentences that you gave me people are connecting with the book and that's what's so miraculous I'm like oh right like I can't numbers doesn't become the quantifier anymore it doesn't become like the litmus test of success for me now it's like who's relating to this book and what are people saying Mm -hmm. and I've like really enjoyed like how I've seen a couple of people be like, this book is incredible, but it, it's so uncomfortable and I have to sit with that. And I've like, yeah, I'm like that's kind of the point. You're not supposed to be resolved by the end of the book. It's, there is no resolution, mm-hmm. spoiler alert. But like, you know, I think that it was really important for me to write a baby step and she makes a baby step. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, is really like it, and we are constantly getting to that place and then coming back right here again and then going through the motions again and then making another little step. And you know, it's so cyclical. And so like a bird is just like on one person's very beginning journey of self-actualization and healing. Yeah. Why, why? knowing the um how sacred this work is I use the word sacred in in a way that's very subjective to me but how um important the work is as you mentioned in especially South Asian communities um how come it's so hard for you to feel pride in your work it's just (laughs) been a burning question I'm like why girl what (laughs) I think it comes back to my abuse because there's no other explanation 
like it's so it infuriates me as well like I'm like fucking hell just like get over it and that's why like you know having articulation more and more articulation over like the ways in which I was abused and understanding that it's a very it's common but not in the way that it happened to me you know my mom is like really a dictator and it is it was extremely violent for my sister my father and I to grow up in her presence and then I was also also sexually abused by her so it's like there's like this added component of um trauma that I'm like I I literally figured out when I was 29 so two years ago so that's why I think also my journey and my writing or something like my newsletter, it requires a commitment from the reader as well, because the vulnerability that I show, I don't think people fully understand that it's like, I am pouring my heart out every fucking day because again, otherwise I would die. I don't have a lot holding me up. And it's just like the ways in which abuse works and sexual abuse works and incest works and and it's the energetics of something that's like I'm also so porous and so I am not just carrying my pain or my mother's pain I'm I'm carrying a fucking ancestry of pain that is like trapped in my body and it this is an, a common occurrence for a lot of us but we don't have knowledge mm-hmm. you know and self-knowledge. Just the contemporary like being Muslim, 9-11, everything that we've been seeing over the last, you know, couple of decades, it's a lot for one person to carry. And I mean, I don't know you as well as you know yourself, but it to a person who can relate in so many different levels with your writing, um, it is a moment of pride that someone can have the courage to share so openly, because I think that takes a type of strength that I don't think many of us carry. Mm. I mean, I think the strength that we carry is just showing up and being resilient enough to function in society. Um, But then to be able to function and coexist in society and then write about it, I just like, it it really does bring up a lot of pride in my body when I think of the successes of especially Brown sisters, because I just know so intimately the types of traumas that exist there. So it's a very common story that we all share. Um, And I guess I have to ask you this if you feel comfortable answering, but you know, we've spoken about matriarchy in our email exchange and in your home, which is very uncommon, it was you not being protected by the matriarch of your home or by the woman of your home. How does, how does, how do you redress and take ownership of matriarchy in your life after having dealt with that? That's a really good question. I think about, you know, I think about power a lot because of this, because like, I think, so basically I was able to see my mom clearly for two major reasons. One, when Me Too happened, something felt really unsettled in my body. I was like, this just like this, this narrative around like, sexual violence just doesn't feel complete. And it was like this gnawing voice that just kept saying something. Um, And of course it was because eventually I realized like my mom had been my own sexual abuser and I never felt like I could say that because she was a woman. Mm. And, And then like obviously then being a queer person and being in queer relationships like with women or femme, people and then seeing like oh shit like actually people are just manipulative and and abuse power that's it like men do it more readily because they are often in positions of power but it's not it's inaccurate to say that only men do it and in my own professional life you know I've experienced so much trauma around friendships turning sour because of success um and usually mine. And then it's like, and then of course, on the other end, it's like, I still experience jealousy. I still, I still, I have to work through those feelings as well. But it's like not wanting to impose or hurt somebody else because of my insecurities. 
I think that's the difference of like what's not being talked about in society. And I think because women have so much, women and femme folks have so much pent up and psychological trauma or sociological trauma, even like I think back to, and I've written about this, just like the bromides that your mothers tell you, the stories that they tell you about other women, about their characteristics. You know, like my mom would always be like, women are not trustworthy or whatever. And it's like, why would you say that? Mm. And what? who are you talking about because we're women and so I examine all of that the all of those things a lot because I think the more I get clear on myself and like I think it's as you kind of like articulated as well like obviously having more pride in myself and pride in sort of the the service um, oriented person that I am naturally has allowed me to trust myself and trust that I have like strong intuition and strong integrity. And so because of my particular kind of like abuse as well from the hands of my mother and the matriarchy, I am very compliant. And so it's been really interesting to see who will ma manipulate that. Um, and I think the more observational I can be not even like applying judgment. I'm finally at a place where I can like look at things objectively and not apply judgment. I think that's just allowing me to have more compassion overall for how hurt we all are and how we're just like trying to like figure out that hurt. And it's so much easier to come to someone and blame them or point fingers or, you know, like I once got called like um, a narcissist by a friend and I was just like, I didn't know how to take a selfie until 2016. You know, it's like things like that where like people will hurt you exactly in the ways that they know how to. They know how to. So fascinating. I mean, I, I'm i like a true Capricorn in, in the sense of like what, what one would perceive a Capricorn to be. And I remember going to a couple of years ago, um, this conference that takes place every three years called Women Deliver. And I was part of a Toronto delegation that went there. And, and there were women from all over the world um, showing up in saris and, you know, kafghans and headdresses. And it just, it was this type of power of 8,500 women from around the world that I'd never experienced before uh, growing, in, growing up in such, um, in such, uh, overt patriarchy and so the question that they asked throughout this conference was um and it was in beautiful bc so i felt safe as well which was another thing i think it was just one of those things that was like time and place that allowed me to really flourish there but the question they kept asking the delegates was um what are you going to do with your power and this was a question they asked over and over again at all of the different sessions and I'm a, I'm a keener, so I actually tried to go to multiple sessions. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to the opening of this one and then I'll like sneak away and go to this one over here. And so I was asked to double, let's say. <laughs> and then at the end of it, I was in the, this kind of decompression lounge where you could just go there and like have a moment. Mm -hmm. And the woman sat next to me and, and, and you know, you like lanyard, hi, I'm Raji Willendorf, nice to meet you. You know, and she was this like 26 year old woman from Bangladesh who said with her power, she's going to, in her lifetime, change the word um, child bride to pedophilia. And I just was like, holy fuck. And I, I almost started crying because I was like, when I was asked that question, I was being confronted with the fact that I had power to begin with. I was like, wait, I have power? Because I've it, that whole idea, this notion that a brown, Punjabi sick woman out of rural BC having any power was just so beyond me that I had to just reconcile with the fact that that is a possibility, let alone something that I'm going to try to use and, and focus in any sort of way. And so when people, I think, have perceptions of you, as I think most people do in this day and age, is kind of judgment from afar because of the social media and all the tools that allow us to do that. Um, it's really hard to have these types of very open and vulnerable conversations being like, hey, um, 
to one of the girls from Toronto just being like, hey, I, I didn't think I had power. It's because I was like sexually assaulted and all of my sexuality, all of my femininity was like really robbed of me, from me from a young age. And I, I think I need to reconcile this. And then to say that to someone who's an un, unwilling participant of something like that was hard because they're just like, oh yeah, I mean, that must be tough. And meanwhile, you're just like, I just shared like this huge vulnerability. And I feel most people, I've realized you can't really just have, we're not in a day and age yet where we can share ourselves so vulnerably and, and show up with so much of our truth and expression. And I think, again, that's why this kind of invisible labor that you were speaking of and, and everything you wrote about in your newsletter, it just resonated because I was like, it's these little experiences that make us want to become invisible. It's like, oh my God, don't look at me. Don't, don't, let's never talk about that again. Um, so I want to segue this conversation um, because I think you shared something very vulnerable with me and I shared very something very vulnerable with you. This idea that you shared with me about sacred reciprocity. And if you can tell me a little bit more about where that comes from and, and what that means for you. Yeah, Robin Wall Kimmerer has this incredible, um, uh, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer firstly is a poet, Thuwami elder, um, writer, um, scientist who uh, wrote Braiding Sweetgrass and she wrote this uh, beautiful piece about service berries in the Emergence magazine about a month ago. And again, this is something that I'm learning, the idea of sacred reciprocity, I'm learning through the teachings, the teachings of grandmother ayahuasca. But when you create that kind of bond with a plant and with the, the medicine, I think you begin to understand that there is a sacred order to things and that partially it kind of goes back to what I was saying about all the things that were robbed of us um, through colonization. One of those things is this understanding that nothing is owed to us and that we are not, capitalism makes you think that like whatever you want you can have without necessarily giving anything back. Whereas so many communities pre-colonization were built on this idea of you give and you get back. There's like a sacred reciprocity. It's like, mm -hmm. that is just the ways, that's I think the most anti-capitalist way to be. And, you know, I'm thinking a lot about how to move forward in the future. If we really want to collapse capitalism, what are the alternatives? We have to start thinking and structuring, restructuring. I mean, you're a Capricorn, so this is like you're extremely your shit as well. Like we have to figure out how to build societies and like look towards the future because it, there has to be a different alternative um, or different kinds of alternatives, but what do they look like? And so for me, it was really, really important. It's been like a series of just like through IO work, but also my trauma therapy kind of like coming back to this kernel of understanding that I, because of the environment that I was raised in from the get-go, there was something planted inside of me that told me that my life was not my own. And so giving became the only way that I could have any kind of, I don't know, like- You don't it, know any other way, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, like it's, I think it just like, it just became like a default for me. And it was easier for me to just give than it was to think about getting anything back. And I famously, like even up until the last relationship I was in, have been like, I don't have needs. I don't, I don't know what my needs are. And kind of being almost proud of being so pliable and so like able to like retain anything. And yeah, just like there's this moment in ceremony the first time this, this time where I just had this like connection with the earth. And I re realized that like this burden I felt my whole life is most reflected on her, the planet. She carries everything and we extract everything from her. She is literally the 
the epitome of like the plight of women in our yeah. society. And so like when I made that exchange, I was just so humbled, you know, by um, this idea again, that like the reason we are at this ecological climate apocalypse right now is because there was no safe, sacred reciprocity with the land. We just extracted and we just took and, and continue. continue to, yeah. And, and she's really telling us it's time you yeah. have to, doll now because there's no future anymore otherwise absolutely yeah. I mean, but it's it's so true and that's what showed up uh on my mushroom journey as well which was interesting because um the first time i had visualized um so i'm really i have agoraphobia so leaving my house is is very traumatic, uh, let alone like traveling or uh, the other intricacies of, of just day-to-day -day living. And um, that visualization was me standing at the top of this cathedral that I my condo overlooked. And um, there was a tsunami and it was very dark and the waves were crashing below my feet. And, um, and so there were the two big things, deep water and then nighttime, because sometimes that triggers me. I'm, I'm searching for the sun and I'm searching for light. And whenever it would get dark, um, I got obsessed. I would run to the direction of where there was still light. And it, it just became this thing that started consuming me. So during this journey, um, there was this, um, you know, I'm tiptoeing on the top of this cathedral and um, trying not to fall into the water, but there was this ledge on one side of my visualization and it was closer but the infrastructure is very poor so if I had jumped on it it would have collapsed and on the other side there was a ledge that was very strong and solid and it was a little bit further but not beyond reach and when I was like okay I'm gonna jump to that one and, and again this is still in my visualization I looked down and I saw this little boy with blonde hair and um, a plaid shirt that was trying to get up and I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna do now? Like I ain't jumping down there. But then something inside of me was like, well, if not for that, then what's the point of living? If you're not going to be like thinking about the future and thinking about future generations and the health of our, of our planet in general. And I think what I realized was in this, in this spiritual journey that I was so, um, I was so beholden to fear and that fear just held me at so many levels that actually prevented me from, from just living my life and being. Um, so I did jump in the water. And then the next day, when I was just walking around with a friend of mine, telling her the very story that I just told you, she was like, that's whack. I went into this art gallery. And then there's this Inuit artist called Tim Pachulek, who had this huge painting called Sedna's Rescue this mermaid carrying a boy and I was like what the fuck are the odds of that I got wow. it of course and I just have it in the spaces where I feel most fearful just so I could be reminded that you know this is just a fear a temporal fear and spiritually you're free uh so I do you know you'll succumb to the same ideas of fear that are placed on you due to capitalism neoliberalism patriarchy and all of the above colonialism but every so often it's nice to have a reminder that you are free and and you know um i don't like using the word emancipated but yeah just free and fear doesn't need to have a hold on you um there's something that you had asked or something that you had said that i thought really interesting um and i want to go back to it about how we have to kind of reconstruct what living in this world can be and what capitalism or what what this ism could look like um when you and, and i'm going to go to one question before i ask this question which is when you were talking about your childhood in, in the different interviews and books and things that you've written um i have to ask you what inspires so much of your generosity and your giving and the love that you have which sometimes feels like is ironic because you had no love and so it's this kind of like love from this loveless person who is searching um, but despite not receiving it in the conventional ways was still able to give it in abundance have you ever thought about that or is it just something that is so natural to you that you don't even realize how much of an, um, uh, an anomaly this is yeah um, 
Thank you for saying that. I, I, I have realized it. I think a lot of my work is with my therapy is accepting that because a lot of people have convinced me of otherwise while like completely depleting me. That's sort of the, the relationship archetype I get into where like, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving. And, and it's just so interesting. Like even today, my editor, like a friend was, has been really mean to me recently and she called me self-absorbed, which is entirely a projection. But my, I told my editor about this and she was just like, you are literally the least. She's like, I've written, I've worked with so many authors and you are one of the least self-absorbed people I've ever met. And it was just so comforting to hear somebody who doesn't know me that well, who worked so intimately with me. She's my editor on Like a Bird. And, you know, like, I think I take a lot of um, just respite, I guess, in knowing that I'm not working for validation. I would like it. I need it. Yeah. But I'm not working towards that because my goal is bigger than like, am I likable or like how many Instagram followers do I have or whatever? Like, you know, I'm not even saying that I don't fall prey to those things. I do. And like, it's that constant like negotiation between like your higher self and the self that's in this world, you know, where you're just like, oh, you know, things can like bum me out, like losing thought, like that, those things still like upset me. I'm not like shielded from it, but I think I just, I am working towards something that's bigger and that's towards um, true liberation. And I, yeah, it goes back to just like, I give love because we need more of it and I have so much of it. I have so much love. So why not give it? I'm giving it to myself now, finally. And that was, I think, the missing piece. It was that I wasn't, I wasn't giving it to myself first. I was being, because I was taught from a young age to give it all away. Mm -hmm. And that's also how I, I think my, my dad and my sister and I, we all interacted with our mom. Like, the three of us are really good people. Like, it's not just me. It's like the three of us are like some of the most idealistic, incredibly giving human beings I've ever met. My dad is incredible. Mm -hmm. He also doesn't protect me. And that's a tension that I have to engage with. You know, like my whole life, I've been like, I love my dad. I'm so lucky to have my dad. He also let what happened to us happen to us. And he has to live with that. He has to live with the fact that my body was compromised and my sanity was compromised. And now we all have fucking extreme traumas that we're barely like understanding. Um, but, you know, now I'm finally like, okay, I have to give this love to myself. I have so much love to give to myself. Giving to myself is an honor and giving to the planet is an honor. And it, it no longer feels like as much as a drain as it used to feel. And I think because I'm getting better at better at having these boundaries and really understanding that a boundary is not about keeping other people out. It's keeping yourself in and changing that relationship between like, oh, no, I don't go beyond this point. This point does it doesn't make me feel comfortable to go there. So I'm not going to push myself. And just like beginning to like give myself agency that I was never given. Yeah, like I am, I, 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 one of my closest friends, Aditi tells me, she's been telling me for years, she's like, you're Vishnu. And I feel that like irradiating kindness in me where it's like, there's so much resource that I have to being kind and to being loving and compassionate and I know myself, so I'm not going to listen to other people that tell me otherwise. Because mm. the people who know me, know me. Mm -hmm. And you don't have and to pretend it. And you also don't have to, I think that's another thing, almost when you've lived so long being invisible, that when you start to become visible, then you're almost like apologizing for taking space and needing right. validation and supporting the validation. And it's like, no, I, I've been realizing that that is an, an, a very special type of fuckery that I no longer want to engage in. <laughs> um, 
So I wonder then, because I feel the same way. I think about values all the time. And I think about who I am, where I am, uh, as it relates to, to the different things and different people that I have to be around sometimes. And I realized that one thing that inspires me the most is love. And I, I constantly find myself saying, well, if we don't, if not love, then why are we doing this? Like, if not thinking about the planet and how much it radiates and, and it truly feels like there's this beautiful harmony of love that in the natural world um, is abundant. And in the unnatural world, it feels like the extraction, I guess, the way you describe extraction is just kind of taking it. So in this new idea of what the world could look like without capitalism, how does love play a role in that? And what could that all look like? Like, how does that show up for you? I'm just so damn curious. And you have to be a Capricorn. I'm so certain of it. Are you a Capricorn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, Capricorn or Leo, which one? Okay, so you're a Cappy. So yeah. how, how does this world look like for you? When's your birthday? January 17th. Okay. And do you know your moon and everything? I just, <laughs> my best friend knows it a lot more than I do. Um, but I know that I have some Virgo in me, but most of everything is Capricorn. Oh, wow. Okay. When you, when you get a chance, let me know what your moon and your Venus and your Mars are. Um, I'm a Capricorn sun. Cancer moon, cancer rising. Um, I love my chart so much. And yeah, it's really, it really <laughs> it's like, um, just like me to a T um, because I'm in polar opposites. Like that's how, like I'm literally the mother and the father in one. And I feel that way about my life. Um, and I feel that way about the future. I, yeah, I've always been thinking about the future. I've always, you know, I've been in organizing since I was 12. I guess like 12 was a really pivotal year. It was the year that my mom tried to stab me and my sister. It's the year I started writing like a bird. And it's also the year that I started like working in Amnes at Amnesty, which, which was my first organizing job. And it's so interesting how like when you don't have the ability to articulate trauma for for people like me and I think I'm a very like specific kind of person um if you haven't read Gabor Mate's work read When the Body Says No he also does a lot of work in Vancouver yeah so he's like he's been like working in the west coast for so many years and is Canadian and also a holocaust survivor and so much of his praxis comes from understanding how body live how trauma lives in the body and the ways in which it mutates um, and turns into disease and so for me um yeah i've just like been tracking i guess for a really long time unconsciously the way that i am and i think finally i'm realizing that yeah, it's really important to put your skills to use and what better use right now than to future build. And I think the way that love plays into that for me is that we have to understand that all we have is each other. That's all we have. And where our devotion to ourselves and to this planet is what will save her. There's no other way. There's no like scientific resolution. They, they would have done it by now. You know, we're so far gone that, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a futurist and I, I, I'm i like planning on writing a sci-fi novel. So I'm like thinking about these things like hardcore and and just like also looking back, you know, to, to our communities, to these civilizations, to, 
to India, to, you know, the, the Americas, like all of these ways in which there was like a, a togetherness and a, a, a reliability on each other, you know, like a shared mutual reciprocity, a care network, you know, um, there's so many writers that have been writing about this for a while, like Adrian Murray Brown, sort of like, I think like the seminal person who's like thinking about how to investigate communities in order to ensure that we're all collectively working towards the same end. Mm -hmm. And I think abolition is one of those ways in which we're doing it. You know, like if there's no fucking jails and the prison industrial complex is being looked at, then we can actually also look at capitalism and the ways in which these bodies are, you know, further being disenfranchised. And um, yeah, I mean, there's so many ways that I think that we're finally like having a reckoning. But to me, the most important part of it is consistency, a consistency with love, but also a consistency with pressure. Like really understanding that the like the radical love is fierce and angry and rageful love as well. And it has to make room. Right now, there's no other time. We have to, um, like, <laughs> amazing. Brittany Cooper, yes. Um, you have to invest in, in, in demanding. You know, I think Canada, I had a, I was fucking getting into fights all the fucking time when I was living in Montreal. I was fighting literally every white person because I- Y'all not. <laughs> so it's because you were in Montreal. No, I'm just joking. Okay, wait, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, I said it's because you were in Montreal. <laughs> it's true. Montreal sucks. <laughs> people are fucking shit. And I mean, like French people are so Islamophobic and it's like, dude can you you're you're so racist um yeah I had a horrible time in Montreal and a lot of my remembrance of that city is yeah these cataclysmic fights I would have where people were saying the n-word to me and I was the only fucking brown person anywhere in these white ass artist spaces that was fighting you know and saying no you cannot fucking say and then being like like getting pushed back because I'm not black and I'm just like I have enough black friends to know that this one firstly like I mean I I don't even want to get into it but it's just sort of like it, it's this like entitlement that white people in Canada have to their racism their very particular kind of racism which is very like friendly adjacent racism where you know it's everything is a little more it's more British it's more commonwealth it, you know, there's, it's just so much more insidious and quiet. And because it was like this, like, you know, Canadian kind of, you know, we're, we love everyone. We're great to everybody. Um, it's a bypass of actually looking at the stolen land and the fact that like Canada still has connections with the slave trade, that like there was so much unjustness, injustice that happened on this land. Um, that continues to happen. And it's this unwillingness to even go there that I'm like ready to crack in Canada and Canadians and Australia, my two countries, you know, I feel a lot of like, I take a lot of comfort in being a fire starter. It's like a very weird combination of personality that I have. See, I was always afraid. I, I think because when I was young, I, I just was so innocuous like I, I was like wait we're sick so we're supposed to believe in universality and oneness and how we're all the same and la di da di da and um but then it's like because I was in such a white rural town um I would get my wrist slapped for having just white friends or playing soccer with boys when I was like in grade two and I was like why can't I play with boys like I, I couldn't understand these restrictions and then um, even just ideas of casteism and, and shadism that exists. Like I couldn't understand like how I was experiencing racism in my own family, let alone how that, that makes you ill-equipped to deal with actual racism 
outside the house that's you know in those colonial spaces or like art spaces or just even you know um the treatment of you and how severely it's different than you know a white person you only can really notice it when you're standing right next to a white person because you're like oh so that's how they show up for you that's how you're going to show up for me and i get this so i think that that makes canada even more complex and fragile because the people that should be fighting the or the communities that want to and should be fighting for equality fighting for the rights of sovereignty for indigenous communities the people that should be fighting for all these they're still dealing with their own colonial racism and 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 we're like i am not even close to the type of liberated mind that i'd want to be at to confront this next layer of this movement so i i feel for canada because of that but then i also sometimes just feel like i have no community and i don't even belong here and i'm like well where do you belong and and truly i don't know where that is but i think when i made the decision to stop the relationship with that white per white woman that i was telling you about um within seven days i met some of the most extraordinary women and mm -hmm. i was like what the fuck like there's this woman dr andrea um fantona fontana from ocadu who's this black research chair and just fucking awesome and i was i was just in that company and i'm like oh my god like this is belonging i don't need to credentialize i don't need to i don't need right. to do anything i just show up and be me and be honest and that's okay so you know i I think when we close the loops on things and cycles that are not serving us, um, then it opens us up to closer to be closer to the truth that we're supposed to be um, going along. But it's so hard to say. It's so hard to coexist when you have very strong spiritual connections, um, but then to have and function in capitalism in Western countries. I feel like the, the coexistence of these two separate things is very difficult to manage. The things of, of what? Of the person that's inside you. Like there's your spirit, there's your soul, there's your connection yeah. to, to, to Mother Earth, to, um, to the future. Um, and then your human self, in which some people call ego or whatever it might be, but your human still needs to function, still needs to be working within capitalist systems so they can pay for the rent and just survive. And I think that those two separate elements are sometimes in such conflict that makes me even feel more, you know, disenfranchised and kind of, um, yeah, just like a lack of space, a lack of belonging. I feel all, all sorts of these things when the collision of those two things happen. I don't know yeah, I'm... there's like a merging that needs to happen that I think like nobody kind of gives you the roadmap on how to merge those two separate parts of yourself, because that's really where I think what happens is like when people see these two binaries of self, they always choose one and then they think that they can't integrate the other into you can like literally be you can be the person you want to be all the time. And I think, in fact, like that is the way to true liberation, becoming that person. And then, you know, I think I'm seeing it in myself, this like entire, what you're saying about energy of like, you let go of this one toxic person and seven other amazing people come in. We don't even know the kind of resource we can tap into when we're all working within abundance, when we're all like actually, or like even just more of us are like actualizing abundance and actualizing what it means to be full and whole. I think, you know, off, like in the last couple of years, something that I keep coming back to is like, yeah, if not me, then who? And I think that's like a very spiritual, like a lot of spiritual teachers say that there's a turning where you're like, if not me, then who? Like, who am I looking towards like being this role model or like have, being a model of integrity that I want to mm -hmm. follow? Why can't I just make that up for myself and then like keep myself um, accountable? And it's that lack of self accountability, I think, that just like, which breeds capitalism within ourselves because we're not even being accountable to who we are as people. But if you have that eloquence and that kind of commu open communication with self, 
then it's not a judgment or a critique. It's merely something that you're constantly just like encouraging yourself to become. It, it, it requires gentleness and care and love. And that's where self-care comes in. It's like self-care is a reminder that there's something so deeply resistant and cool and powerful to be who you are and do it slowly become that person slowly it doesn't there it doesn't have to be a, like a you know one to a hundred jump like it's just not possible yeah but yeah. to take the it doesn't step, be sustainable either mm-hmm. exactly it's not but when you look at it as sort of a lifelong journey of commitment then it changes the narrative and then you're all of a sudden I think no longer beholden to time you just are yeah you just simply are I like that and I'm, I, I think I, I'm looking at the time and I'm being so mindful of your energy um, and my energy but you know you spoke so beautifully about networks of care and what I'm hearing right now is that that can exist just in a singular you know how your body and your mind and soul and those are just these smaller networks of care that you that one should take care of and try to um, care for slowly and in abundance, but then also how that creates this ripple effect of networks of care systems that can hopefully overthrow capitalism and all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might not happen with us, but you know, we're, we have to look at how the, the, the progression of humanity. I fucking hate cynics and because we have evolved through time. It's just literally right there. And so this is just another step of evolution. We don't want to do the work, but it needs to be done. Yeah, that's it.